Harper, the, man the what, manager of logic design for the computer. John's been the bomb rebuild project manager and on our CCS committee for about 20 years, and he spent most of his time with his career with ICT, ICL. Over to you, John. Can I just do a sound check? Is that all yes, right? Yes. yes. Fine. <coughs> Um, this is my personal story, I should add, and it's meant to be slightly provocative in terms of little digs at marketing. <laughs> um, anyway, let's get off. Um, that's the machine we're talking about. You may notice the colour for a start. That was uh, that's, that is relevant. I made the all the borders hopefully or as matching the colour of the machines. Um, you also find that this presentation does a lot about um, dress styles at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we go from uh, ladies, um, and you'll find later on that it seems to be the standard uniform to have a, a beard and long hair down to your collar at that time as well, if, if you're a man by then. <laughs> I said, it's very much a personal story because um, at that time my boss was Brian Proctor and I have a great deal to owe to Brian, he died some time ago but uh, uh, I think he was, um, did a lot more in ICL than some people appreciated. Those that did appreciate him uh, really understood this. Um, but the original, the first part of this story started in a, almost a clandestine way, uh, with three of us going off, or off-site, a bit before Christmas, to uh, Brian's house, where he set up a table. In fact, it was actually a, a spare door that he was refurbishing at the time. And um, we sat down and worked out the way which you could use uh, this type of microprocessor. The idea was it was, <coughs> it was to eliminate as much hardware as it is possible and put a lot more into microcode than was, uh, had previously been thought of. Microcode had been a very powerful tool for order code, if you like, but it had not been played around with for peripherals in any particular way. Um, I hope you can see that on the main screen. It's a little bit weak on it. No, it seems to be all right. Um, that, just for nostalgia, that is Brian's own notes, right at, at, at the end of a three-day session. Uh, it's only the first page of it, but uh, it does show that, uh, the authenticity of it all. What um, the whole sort of concept was that if you had a very fast, small processor, and you had it. Uh, if you thought it was a conventional one with an A plus B equals C type of arrangement through a mill or adder or whatever terminology you were using at that time, um, if you could actually take the main registers, the, the A, B and C registers, the, the two um, <coughs> that you were multiplying or adding, well, sorry, adding or subtracting, and the C register, and make that out of a chip that had been very conveniently just come onto the market from Texas, which was a register with 16 levels in it. And it would change the level of the contents of that register uh, in one click, one, one beat of the machine. So you could almost make the whole machine do a completely different job with one click and make it be doing, pick up a different bit of cut microcode from a completely different area in the store and start working on it <coughs> until you had a higher order uh, input of some sort, another click, and you're using that processor for another thing. And of course, the hierarchy would be such that disks would be would have the most the highest priority and order code would be pushed down a bit because it was usually waiting for the peripherals anyway. So that was the concept and it was um, in fact, it, um, I may mention it again later, but it was um, a patent was taken out on that and lasted for quite a long time. <coughs> the other co concept really was that um, 
Sorry, I don't have to go on that much. I need to go back. <laughs> two previous. Right. Get two uh, figures. <coughs> the, the other thing you'd need on the end of this microcode was couplers. You're trying to keep the amount of hardware down to the bare minimum. But you nevertheless had to have level changes and what have you, and had to accommodate standard peripheral uh, connections if there are things like disks or and card readers or printers and that sort of thing. But you try to get in at the mechanism level, not at a standard interface or similar type of level. And that's my attempt at coloured uh, diagram is to say that you've got a couple of bus on one side. Uh, <coughs> piece of hardware, which is usually quite small, uh, doing these um, level changes, etc., and an output to the peripheral in question. Now this is rather a bad um, sketch, I'm afraid, but I'm, what I'm doing there is to attempt to show how you would use a printer with a piece of microcode. The first thing you need to do is to know where the barrel is. So you'd have one pickup which told you once per rev of the barrel. And then you could, the microcode would say, right, that's a reference point. You'd have another pickup which said where you were around the barrel. And um, supposedly there were 128 characters. The microcode would then carry um, a counter, which would mean that it always knew where the barrel was. Now when you've got a coincidence between the data to be printed at that level, say all the A's, if you've got a few A's ready to be printed, um, you wait until the barrel said it was at level A, and you fire off all the hammers, you've already uh, filled a chef register um, with all the A's that you want to be printed, and you'd hit the barrel with it, and then it would go on to the next stage. So there's virtually there's obviously got to be real hardware, you've got to have real hammers, you've got to have real bits and pieces. But you don't have to have all those counters um, and other registers that you would normally have in a hardware printer. Which would be on the end of a, of a standard interface of some sort. Whatever the manufacturer, but you'd have standard interfaces. But this effectively limited and integrated the printer except for the mechanism, into the machine itself. I'll take questions as long as I go along, if you like. And we patented that. Um, and you can see three of us on there. Um, Tony Whitby, who was uh, doing the microcode at the beginning, and moved on to 2960 when I took over the, uh, the process of microcode. Let me be specific here, because later on, when you mentioned there was other developments in the microcode to do with things like uh, direct data entry, uh, which was done by another team, which I'll hear about later. <coughs> this is where there was a little bit of politicking going on, um, if that's the best word. We did this, pre this work in December 1971, although it was not recognised even within the labs buildings themselves until the January. We gave a presentation to John Freer, one or two of you may have heard of him, um, from the go-ahead overall manager in the organisation at that time. And uh, he said, get on with it, we'll find the funds somehow. And um, because you can see the product authorisation was not issued in July. You could have Arguably, we were running illegally uh, through the first six months of the project, although we had a lot of support. The machine had to work into what's called a normal office environment, and there's the ranges, which are very wide compared with what uh, mainframes have been in the past. And the power consumption, unfortunately, was a little bit, uh, was relatively low. And you could, um, if you had a single phase version, you could run it on effectively a cooker point type spur. You didn't have to have very expensive uh, installation costs 
like you would with a, uh, a mainframe at that time. And I mentioned earlier about this uh, colour system that was going on at the time, a few debates about what shade of orange it would be in the end. And I remember this, uh, Pimento was painted up some machines that colour and then a lot of uh, wise people came along and studied it and said that's not quite the right shade and, and spent more time on that than developing the machine. Right? <laughs> and there was an outside consultant called Nol London that one or two you may have heard of that was a consultant for ICL over, well ICT and then ICL over a long period. And the person in our area who was uh, working along with that and he did a lot of the physical design, um, which was quite radical for, compared with the, the blue square boxes that we'd had up until that time. That was, that was Sid Martin. That won't mean much to many of you, it just gives you some idea of um, the size of the team that was on the hardware and hardware related microprogram developments against the machine. Uh, Now I'm talking about the basic block diagram, that, that's a sort of an extension of where I was talking about before. You have the, the basic uh, microcode processor, you have to have store, and then you have couplers, and then you can have the basic machine have all these different peripherals, that's pretty well all of them integrated into the machine itself. This is a physical cabinet and electrically, and a minimal number of um, unnecessary, I say unnecessary if the machine was spread around the, uh, a computer room, unnecessary interfaces. That's why I managed to keep the cost down, the, the production cost. To give you an idea of the construction, um, that's the te technology we were using at that time. Um, you could have cards that were four off, two off, and three off, but three off were mainly for the store. Because what was happening, um, well, there's, there's better views there, what was happening was at the same time as we were uh, developing this, we were bringing in MOS store for the first time into ICL. Um, there's, there's a certain amount of uh, controversy here between us and West Gorton, who switched on the first MOS store uh, in England, in, in Britain, because we believed that we were the only people that were supporting Intel at that time. Some of us might have said, we, if this hadn't worked, Intel wouldn't have existed. It's quite, right in at the beginning of a big firm like that. Um, we had quite a lot of problems though, um, this being a dynamic store, you had to. Get, um, it was made up effectively of little capacitors that would die away, so you had to run around continually. You had a vacuum process that went around and recharged uh, every capacitor uh, to back to where it was. It may be discharged, but if you left it discharged, or if you, so the whole thing was dynamic, and if you stopped. You, there was no store left. That was one of the small disadvantages because you get an old 1903 or something, the core store would um, be retained most of the time. You just switch on in the morning and it remembers where the, where the startup processes were in the store. But we lost all that and we had to replace it with, um, with ROM. That's on the side. Um, it became a bit unreliable until it was worked out that you need to actually put a few more extra little pulses into the time of every chip and this we managed to overcome with a thing called pre-charge. But to be on top, be careful, on, on top of this we still had one or two failures. It was not, when they supplied these chips they were not perfect. They quite often uh, came with effectively er built-in errors. But fortunately the errors were permanently there and didn't grow too much. They were there. So we had a thing called, a, we patented another thing called a, a floor store, which went around and substituted with a bit of much higher speed memory 
for any memory location that was um, known to be faulty. So, so it was an online power operated patch. <coughs> we also had Hamming as well in those days and we'd, um, we'd gone beyond parity, we'd gone into Hamming correction. And um, that was quite something for the time. The other thing that was caused a little bit of interest, it, wouldn't, it wasn't exactly a problem, but we were actually making the same store boards do for a 24-bit 1900 and a 32-bit um, uh, four-byte machine, which is what we were working on. That was the core machine, was a, a byte machine four off. It turned out that we ended up by making 13-bit boards. Seems pretty un <laughs> weird, doesn't it? But uh, we had two for uh, 1900 working, 24 plus parity, and uh, three for the basic um, 2903, uh, which at that time was called Mycos One, and um, that allowed us an extra bit for additional uh, activity I might be able to come on to later. Oh, I've mentioned that. Did we save Intel in its infancy? <laughs> Sounds an interesting discussion. That, that's just to give you some idea of the layout of a 13-bit um, storeboard. Drivers at one end, all these 1K, and it sounds small now, 1K dynamic chips um, on a 16 lead pack. Um, and the whole um, car was 4K by 13 bits. And to tell you that was, that said quite a lot at the time, and now it doesn't. And that floor store I mentioned also had a, a patent uh, with it. I'm moving on now uh, to the uh, peripherals. Um, Le Letchworth had been producing, but not got into any volume production or delivery, of a thing called a 667 printer. Quite a nice mechanism, a bit expensive to make, and eventually had to be phased out. Okay, okay. Um, it was called limited front stop. Now, now, the advantage of that over a lot of the printers that uh, ICL and other people had at that time uh, with a barrel printer was, as you can see, that lady is um, pulling the paper up. It didn't need double-ended tractor feed, it was just enough to be the top tractors pulling it through. Print, lean back that front air, open the top, lean back that front air where all the hammers were, pull the paper up, and put it onto the um, one set of tractors. Then you close the front, put the lid down, and there it is. It was very easy to get jams out of it and change paper. It then had one other um, significant advantage. If you took the paper away and you pulled a lever down at one side, you could take the whole barrel out. It was a tube with one notch to make sure it went in the right place which meant we could actually do a completely different character sets as long as the microcode was loaded with the, uh, the full repertoire of characters. So it's a very um, um, versatile little machine and lots of you operators really liked it because you could uh, not like these great analexes and things that you know, get right over and when it goes wrong it goes over the place. This was a little thing down there that there was only 300 lines a minute, that was the problem. But uh, it was a nice little machine, and it uh, uh, we made a couple of thousand of them. So, well, the factory did. did. And a nice little 300 card a minute mechanism round at the time, and that was um, it's a bare mechanism, except for the motors and uh, the picker knives and that sort of thing. It fitted very nicely into the cabinet and um, had only a very small. Um, coupler card and about uh, seven inches square. That was it between that and the um, machine itself. 
these were rather advanced as well at the time. Um, fixed and exchangeable disk stores, I mean the capacities are tiny now. Um, but again, that worked pretty well in a, a normal life environment because it was, um, the air was ducted in such a way that it uh, was effectively cleaned on the way. And we had, uh, they were very reliable, we didn't get much trouble. The problem was for the um, systems people trying to allocate what would be on a, on a removable part and what would be on a fixed part uh, of the, the disc itself. Whereas today we've got fixed discs, are fixed discs, and the uh, exchangeables are exchangeables. This had both on the same spindle, so if you stop to change the exchangeable part, you lose the fixed part for that period of time. But um, nobody seemed to complain too much, they just People got round that without any trouble. This was at the time quite an innovation. Um, the first um, 1900, if you like, or derivative of, that um, had a video console instead of a clanking old typewriter um, that usually went wrong and the bearing seized up and all that sort of thing and paper all over the place. To be honest though, um, Kids Grove were developing um, um, a high performance, high capacity uh, video console at the time for new range. Um, and they were a fair way down the track, so we pinched quite a few of their ideas and brought it back. And we went to production before they did in the event. Um, also spilling off from this, which we'll touch again perhaps later, is that the um, the DDEs, the direct data entry terminals, also fell out of this same development, but they had less characters on the screen. Uh, well, I'll come on to that, but it was quite interesting. That day and age, you couldn't even buy a chip that would turn a character into um, the, the pixels that went on the screen. We actually, actually designed the logic and we looked in order to make characters look quite neat, um, we added a bit of interpolation uh, logic. So if, um, if you think of uh, two rows of pixels, a group of four, you could calculate the one in the middle to raise the posi uh, position of the character and the size of it. And that's a, it was a fairly straightforward circuit once we worked it out, but it did do uh, quite a good job. I was interested to see the other day that uh, they're now doing a similar technique to transmit televisions that are 2K, so-called, up to 4K by taking the signal and then interpolating it up to give a higher resolution on your television screen without any, any higher input of um, data. We thought of it first. <laughs> no, we didn't. We put it out the like an Eric paper. Um, <coughs> Touching on the, the, the direct data entry, um, that was the hardware, that was a spill-off really from the video console. And from our point of view, that was very easy. But it did actually bring in to um, microprogram develop from another team, which I think Brian Millis is going to mention um, when I finished, as he was very much involved in the software side of microprogram as opposed to the a microprogram used in hardware support and order code uh, functions. That seemed to be quite a good selling point. Some people uh, thought it was a little bit crude, but we managed to sell quite a few, so can't be too unhappy about them. Now, the market said it was just not ready for new range, not by a long, long way when uh, we were doing this. And also, um, none of the VME was that ready. Colin might say something about this, but um, there was quite a bit uh, of concern within the company that we've got to get something in the marketplace. And the only way it would be is a souped up 1900 at that stage. And it carried on that technique, unfortunately. Um, so we had to produce a 1900 standard interface coupler. Now that is what you might expect, it got drivers, it got uh, clock pulses and what have you. Um, but it also um, uh, came onto a coupler in the same way, went into the 
but also the um, dedicated microcode for that hard to drive that hardware. And of course, that was quite a bit more to that than there was to something like a printer or a card reader. But in that application, we left the third store out. Um, still needed three wide, only 39 up to 39 bits for the main microcode, but we didn't need it for the uh, 1900 store. So we actually left cards out and it was figured, configured in a way so that the back plate could be working, two or three way working. Um, I'm jumping ahead slightly, but one of the weaknesses, you like, of 2903 running, or MyCos1, you want to call it, running um, 1900 code was we were told, I'm sure the experts knew what they were talking about, that much too much time was taken in the, in the microcode of turning 6 to 8 and 8 to 6 conversions. They were not an easy process and they were quite heavy on the uh, amount of micro. So we built an extra card specifically for 1900 work. It's the only bit that really made it in 1900. Um, but you just fed in your 24-bit uh, word and got 32 out or vice versa. Uh, as a, almost one click. Um, but things like card conversion and all those sort of things, they were also back into the microcode um, as a need to read sort of things like uh, 1900 card codes. Um, anyway, uh, moving on a little bit, we, uh, um, the machine was fairly well endowed with engineering facilities um, and I think that paid dividends perhaps a little bit more than some people would have liked. But Brian Proctor had come from a background of field engineering and I come from a background and we were a little bit sympathetic to those people who came banging on the door make sure we could mend the damn thing. Um, and uh, I think we don't regret having put that amount of hardware in because I did play off. And when we got, we, at the time we put it in, we didn't think we were going to sell so many. But field engineering, we put under quite a lot of strain with the large numbers across the world that were sold at the end. So we were rather pleased with that in the event. This thing called MyCOS 1 um, was <coughs> a basic process that was meant to do various different jobs. Um, one of the applications of thing called CPC4, which was meant to went along the corridor to the guys doing communications, and they used it for a completely different um, operation, all the time they were in um, light working. Um, I might invite Jim right, right at the end, if you wouldn't mind talking about what happened to the VME and Dal Keith experiments based on a MyCOS one. And then we took a lot right into collaborations. It didn't come up, it didn't come off, but um, spent some time at next door of computers because they could see they needed a top end machine that would run their order code and collect their peripherals on. Because we had with that amount of flexibility and and we were going to make quick, quite quick and cheap additional couplers for different types of peripherals. We were well placed on that. Um, and technically, the talks that. Um, I went over with a couple of other guys, uh, went very well, but I don't know what happened at the uh, politics <coughs> level, decided <laughs> so not to go ahead. And the same thing happened at Singer, this is before Singer really came into a, a, a IC, ICL, we went along to Singer as, as they stood, which was also in Stevenage, are you there Colin? Uh, some of your team were, um, to talk about what was going to happen um, if we <coughs> stuck a more powerful processor in the centre of their peripherals and their order code. Very interesting technical exercise, and I, as an engineer, I never knew quite why it didn't happen, but you get, don't get to hear about those things. The time scale was extremely tight. Um, we were really into a rush job. This, you must say I can't read this, but what it's trying to say is that 
we actually did the whole thing within the time scale, we achieved all the objectives within the time scale, including adding DDE on as an afterthought. Um, well, a late requirement, let's put it that way. Um, and we managed to catch that up as well. But we did have to, um, the team were very effective. We managed to get people to work around the, around the week uh, and really long hours during the week by sh spreading the whole thing around. Um, couldn't have been done without a team that was actually willing to uh, see things uh, succeed. Yeah, it's supposed to have gone on. Oh, it has now. Um, this all uh, work, I suppose, mostly culminated in the Hanover Fair launch. And um, as you can see, we, the Hanover Fair was April 73, um, which is a complete machine, virtually working. Um, I say virtually, there was one or two snags still with it. Um, in 16 months. Not, I don't think you do that sort of speed these days. Um, it was all because of um, uh, cooperation and a winning team and uh, all the right people involved at the right time. The, uh, jokingly, I said almost working, um, Jeff Cross came out to see the machine at Hanover Fair and although he was supposed to be the main audience, he disappeared at one instant we don't know where he'd gone. He'd gone round the back and talked to one of our team. And what's that tape deck doing there? Is it all a sham, the whole thing? Uh, but he was very well convinced that the only thing we'd got wrong, we needed that for, was to load up the sort of, a, what people call initial orders in other areas, but our load up microprogram was still being developed on a almost daily basis. So we were compiling it on a, um, on normal nights they have a tape deck and feed in the tape deck in um, to, at the very start of the day. The rest of it ran by itself. We proved that by putting the plug out once it got going. Um, anyway, there's some interesting sidelines to all this. Now we go into production. Um, as you can see, it became a very busy uh, organisation. It really did start to move. But the first handful, the, the guys on final test didn't really come up to speed in the first few weeks. So some of our team were allocated over to um, bring them up to speed. But once they were, they didn't need more help, they were really good. Those machines whistled out of the Letchworth factory. Unfortunately it's been condemned and set on fire and about to be doing about now. These are just some of the stages of the production. You can see it coming together. It's a bit publicity, really, as photographs, but it was the way in which the thing came together. And then it goes in the final test, the quality control. That was quite a big factory for those who knew it. As I said, it's not my area. <laughs> The way I was told it at the time and how it was coming over was that um, I say I was in a real dilemma. I wanted 2900, got all, most of the resources pointing at 2900. Um, hardware wasn't that ready, some of the Stevenage hardware wasn't on time, and um, what was worse was that we weren't quite sure what operating system was going to come because we had a lot of uh, overseas, including Americans, who thought they could do it better. Uh, in the end, it was the British design work that did, did work <laughs> in the longer term. And the marketing strategy, as I understood it, was it would be a top-down, do 2980 first. But then IBM decided to do it the other way up and brought out the um, three, System 310. Um, the ICL responded by starting to go from bottom up. Small machines coming through to the bigger ones at the end of the operation. 
Pichillo's at the back there. You can blame him for that quote. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> the system three. <laughs> says that you introduced, that IBM introduced a system three entry level machine and cut into the sales of the 1901, etc. That's quoted off your um, website, by the way. Um, you, Perth Brian, you take about the RPG compiler when we get there. Sales successes were much greater. It was partly down to Jeff, Jeff Cross who said, when we said we'd make 600, he said make 800. No, he didn't, he said. <laughs> Came back three weeks later, he said make it 2,000. <laughs> he said, well, it was all right for Americans with their production facilities to say that sort of thing, but it was quite a shock for our manufacturing people to be told they're going to ramp it up to almost twofold, threefold. Um, to some extent, I'll let you read some of that itself. I hate it when people read off screens in all detail. Uh, and those values, you can see it became a very important um, revenue stream for the machine for ICL at that time. And uh, some people say we made two and a half thousand, some people say we made nearly three, three thousand machines which was a lot of machines for ICL at that time. Now we're going to see if this works. But some people only need a small computer. There are others in the same 2900 series, one being specially suited to small users. It's called the 2903, and it's the kind of machine which handles straightforward data processing. A little firms like laundries, motor repairers, turkey breeders, accountant, small banks, or even professional societies. It can cost as little as £40,000, and a thousand have already been sold in two years. A British record. <laughs> you notice the uniform you have to wear in it. <laughs> but some people... Oh, well, it's not supposed to happen again. The 2903 needed to be upgraded, um, as everything does, you can't stand still. And we started in Stevenage on the, um, the 2904. Some of the developments we actually did and some we put in train ready for later on. When the product authority moved to West Gordon, a few of us, some, some of the team actually moved to West Gordon, some of us were on tap to West Gorton for some of the time. Um, but as I've said in that middle, like, it was under pressure for enhancements beyond the design limits of the machine. And um, quite a lot of them did work and it did actually make a lot more sales, but um, there was pressure from the IBM 34, I am told, by marketing colleagues. And so we, they moved moved into an ME29. Now, I don't know much, too much about that, so uh, I'll leave that for others and perhaps another day. The 29, you can see on that 2904, the printer has been replaced by a Borsin, I think it's a data products printer. Uh, I say we're trying to close down the mechanical production facilities anyway in Letchworth. Um, they didn't want to make any more heavy iron, uh, high position stuff anymore. So unfortunately the uh, whole place had been wound down. That's why one of the reasons the printer went, but it was a bit cost costly for its performance. I did things like uh, EDS-60s. That wasn't much of a problem actually, but I uh, notice on that one they haven't been painted the same color. Well, you can't see the color, but I can tell you that was there were blue ones on that machine, but uh, they did come through as um, Tango the same. Uh, and just briefly, what else happened? Um, we had, there was a point where we were told by marketing they'd sold, committed very few 2960s as VME machines. And there was a hell of an inventory and going to be a real problem with cash flow for the company. 
So we had to drag the DME 1900, which is um, out. Not our team, except the fact that colleagues of mine on the 2960 had made a MyCOS 2, which gave same similar sort of flexibility to the 2903, but uh, much more powerful. And then I thought, right, we can all sort of settle down a bit now. Then they came, after they came along the lecture and said, almost the same thing's happening on 2950. We've got to sell them as, uh, we can't sell them as uh, VMware machines. Things aren't ready yet. Um, so unfortunately, they had to go out as 1900s. So it's a very difficult period. But that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Like to introduce? Yes. Um, questions and comments. And first of all, um, Brian Millis, um, who, who uh, worked, who was charged of the software unit, and uh, Steve Lynch, and um, the formal systems management role was there. So you've got some comments you'd like to make, Brian. Is that, is that time? Can we go? Uh, the, the way that um, ICL was organized for development, um, there was a major software unit separate from the hardware development units that were stored in Stevenage. Um, but uh, with the hardware units on 1900, there was always a small software unit as part of the hardware unit. Um, this would have obviously been covered in the 1900 presentations that uh, uh, before, but um, it was an important factor in the 2903 as well. Um, I was the manager of the software unit at Stevenage, um, and it, which included the internet software connected with with the uh, hardware. Um, and the sort of operate up to a sort of level of a small operating system. Um, and incidentally also the test programs, which were of course quite important. Um, the, uh, and th this enabled us to sort of work very closely with the hardware designers. Uh, it's a pity, in, in my view, that this structure eventually got dismantled, dismantled by management, but that's um, a, a later story. Um, my recollection of is entirely from memory, because I haven't managed to find any documents relevant to it. Um, but I, a few things I recall is the argument that went on with planning about whether, in fact, this uh, Michael Space uh, system should be the uh, should be produced as opposed to I think there was a strong view in parts of the planning organization that it would be better to have a pure hardware and it would be cheaper to be able to do that. Um, in this context I remember Norman Brown. Norman was the manager of the uh, Stevenage development. Um, he was my boss and also Brian Proctor's boss um, under John Freer. And Norman was at a touch of genius. He, he, one, of, one of which was winning arguments. And I, I would go into a, a session with Norman, absolutely convinced that you were right. And somehow you emerged to be convinced that he was right. And in this particular case, he persuaded the planning that this, this uh, icon space machine really was the right thing to have. I think one of the arguments was that it could be a swing machine. It could become a 2900. Um, in practice, this never happened. Because in fact, the, the weight of the 2900 um, native software would have killed it. Because, um, <laughs> very, very large software eventually emerged. Um, and somewhat ironically, as John has already covered, what happened, actually happened was a reverse Instead of this, the, the small machine swinging and becoming a 2900-based machine, the opposite happened, that the 2950 and 2960 
was swung the other way and turned into 1900s and sold in that way. And this, as John said, really sort of rescued the, that, that, the ICL at that time, given the teething problems that, were, that occurred on 2900 software development in particular. And uh, uh, Colin Taylor, who took over the unit, um, my deputy at Stevenage, for many years, then took over the unit after I left Stevenage, again produced um, the necessary 1900 executives um, in the form of that produced these DME and CME machines. Um, so that, uh, the one of the major changes on 293 was this uh, video console replacing the typewriter, as John mentioned. Um, and again, we adapted the executive program to use that console uh, instead of the typewriter. Um, this, I believe, IBM, I believe, have been, I've been told, uh, we're trying to find out what 2903 was actually going to consist of. And I believe that this video console came as a major surprise to them. Though if there's anyone from IBM present, we might like to comment on that. <laughs> um, the, the other, other major differentiator was the introduction of this direct data exchange. My team actually did the microprogramming of that. The direct data exchange was intended to replicate an, a very unintelligent card, card producing machine, um, data, card data entry machine, uh, with of course the, the uh, data going directly into the uh, system, but with formatting as part of, the, of that process. Um, there was a, a direct data entry unit in um, ICL, and again, if anyone's present from that and knows about that, further information might be of help and interest from that. There was also some, some VDU, uh, it, other, other VDU attachments. I'm not, I cannot now remember quite the time scale of all that, how that happened. Um, and how, the, how those were brought in. And again, I don't know if you remember that, that, that would be of interest. Um, as it's already been mentioned, there was an RPG uh, software development. Um, this, we had previously had a form, a similar thing called Nikol, but decided to replace that uh, with um, a true RPG language implementation. I recall that it was very slow um, and again I don't know whether anyone here uh, has any memory of that. With Rachel, it was hindsight whether that's a case where we could have done something clever with microcode, I don't know. Part of the problem here was that the, uh, the, the 1900 order code wasn't really ideal for um, RPG. I think the the, uh, 1900, the sort of architecture that was better than the data had in System 10 and System 25. Um, already we mentioned that Jeff Cross ramped up the numbers uh, hugely and way beyond what had originally been envisaged. And uh, my last story of it all is going to the Hanover Fair. Um, so if anyone else uh, has got or I'd certainly like to invite is if anyone has got memories of other software development that was done um, at the Brackmore and elsewhere on the 293, welcome, we were reminded of all that. Thank you. I've got a 
few comments. One, thank you for the 2903. I used one at one time, we replaced a 1901A with it, with a little system running in Nicole, which transferred straight across. The one thing that was kept from the 1A, we had a, it was called a balancer. It had a till roll on the side and was some sort of mechanical adding machine. You put the cards through it to give you a control total first. You then fed the cards through the machine, and when the print, print, if the printout differed from the balance on the mechanical balancer, you juggled the cards until and refed them until such time. <laughs> I don't wish to know that. <laughs> and we in fact continued that same system on the 1904S under George III, where instead of fiddling the cards, they used the editor to juggle the pack. <laughs> um, but it was a very nice machine. Thank you. Um, RPG, we still, I still have some of the RPG system at home. I don't know how much of it we've got, but it might be slow because some of it was written in COBOL. We actually have, I actually have some of the sources that we've, re we've recovered from some of the old 1900 software tapes. And we still have the Nikol compiler and uh, can still write in Nikol. Thank you. Sorry, I was one of the marketing people that he was using. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I'll make the look. one of the marketing people that uh, was gently abused by my development friends down here earlier. But we survived and we actually made it work. And uh, um, there was an anecdote which I can verify because I was one of the people watching it happen at the time. Um, as you notice, the 2903, as it turned out, was the first product from ICL to go out in the chosen 2900 colours and style, i.e. hot tango, as it turned out, and the, uh, the logo style and typeface style for the labels, etc. And there was a, an occasion, uh, you mentioned um, uh, Noel London, who was party to this, um, that, that logo that you see on the, all the products, etc., and on the, on the presentations. Um, Noel London was presenting the packaging design to Jeff Cross and Co. in Putney. And um, they were looking at these labels, and Cross looked at it and said, uh, Will you take that, will you walk down the corridor on the 14th floor, please, and walk away from me? and I can't, uh, when I can't see the label, I'm telling you it's not big enough. So I want you to actually make that logo bigger. And it turned out like this. And it actually followed through on all the 2900 as well, as you may remember. But that's just one little bit of the marketing input on this. Why was a George III executive member developed in 2903? Surely it would have been powerful enough to run it. Oh, I, think, I think the answer is that it wouldn't be ready. It was. Hello. Um, the, the 2903 was a small machine. Um, George III was a very, pretty big operating system. Um, so we would have, we could use George. Well, we what we did was we integrated some of the facilities of the small operating system George One into the executive, um, and that was used. But George Three, I think, really would never would have been too overweight. It would run though, wouldn't it? Uh, no, it wouldn't actually. No. Uh, we would have had to have developed a special executive. George III was unlike um, other 1900 software in that it didn't run on top of the normal uh, standard executive which we made compatible all the way up the range. It required its own executive, which was much more like a BIOS. It just did the essential features of um, looking after the peripherals and the sort of intimate switching of, uh, of, the, of the hardware rather than being effectively 
able to be used freestanding just by itself. And you require that under George III. So we, we, could, we, we, we would have had to have developed such an executive to enable it to run. Um, but we never did, and as I said, I don't have a, I think it would have just not had the, and 293 would have had the power to be able to effectively make George III effective. So. Uh, yes, <coughs> I was actually body shocked to ICL to work on the RPG system for the 2903. Um, not actually working on the RPG compiler itself, but working on a translator. And I, as, as far as I recall, the idea was that the translator was to translate IBM data into 2903 format. Um, so that it could be, so that they could um, directly market against and take over IBM um, sites uh, that were running RPG programs. Um, and uh, you know, so I'd say that the main thing that we were, what I was actually doing, although some of the other members of the team were working on the compiler bits, what, what myself and a colleague were doing was. Um, doing this translator for translating data, um, so it read in an RPG definition of the data in RPG and then translated the data. Um, one question that uh, I'd be interested to know whether there is an answer to, when we were doing this, we were told that we weren't allowed to use, um, it was on the 1900, you, you've got eight registers, eight registers and one, two, and three were index registers, uh, were, were different than they had done, the index registers, I think. Um, and we were told that we weren't allowed to use one of those index registers. And we were told that the whole 2903 architecture was all very, very secret and very hush-hush, and so we couldn't be told why this was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were told that we, weren't allowed to use one of the registers and we assumed that that was because in some way it was used in some special way in the 2903. You know, I, was I, that true? I, I can't remember whether there was, I, I don't think, I can't remember whether, we, I don't recall that we put any restrictions on what was allowed to be used. Um, we were writing in plan, of course. Yeah. Um, Colin, do you remember anything like that? I, I, I do. I don't remember that we imposed any restrictions. Who did? Why? I don't know. No. <laughs> it might have been planned. I don't know. Does anyone, anyone else got any insights into that? Um, oh. I'll work the same room. Mm -hmm. Some of the answers. Have you heard the there. same rumour from the club? I have the same rumour without any restrictions. Yeah. That was what seemed to us yeah. over here. And they didn't. Uh, if it was that much of a restriction, you'd imagine that they would have um, policed it in, in software somehow, but that wasn't the case, so I don't know what it was about to join. Um, I, uh, I worked in the Putney Customer Centre um, from uh, 1974 onwards, um, and I can certainly confirm that there were lots of rumours as to the restrictions as what programmes could be uh, run. Um, I think the only, it was said in the material that we had that the only programs that could run were written in either RPG2, COBOL or Fortran. And it, it was certainly not clear that you could take a plan program or, or, or whatever and run it on a 2903. In point of fact, we tried it and they all worked, of course. <laughs> Thanks to... Um various colleagues, including Bruce Patterson here, yeah. the 1900 compatibility was actually very good all up the road. And uh, so I really can't see why, why that sort of restriction uh, mm -hmm. Yes, probably. Uh, so, I'll come back around in a second. Say a few words about the generality of the hardware that John's described. I worked for the Advanced Research Department at Stevenage, who were known to, be, known to do something rather different. And uh, following John Eilif's basic language machine, we worked considerably on architectures with fine protection, using, using code words and uh, tagged stores. 
And uh, the reference in John's talk to Dalkeith was uh, because a project that we had developing things um, with a fine protection architecture was actually moved to Dalkeith. Um, what we did was to extend the, um, uh, the fine protection architecture to, um, uh, hold on, an age thing, thoughts disappear. We're back in a moment. <laughs> uh, to actually provide microcode support on uh, the MyCOS one uh, for high level languages. And uh, so we had a project that we moved, that moved to Dalkeith. We commissioned it on a 32 bit or 39 bit, as John would call it, MyCOS one, and uh, uh, produced some uh, very good results. Um, comparing COBOL programs uh, that were using hardware assistance. However, um, despite the success, um, VME promised so much in that era that um, it was not carried forward. A lot of the people who worked on, people who worked on it, uh, both from our team and, uh, and from uh, Brian's team, uh, joined Plessy and worked on PP250, which was a, a, a telephone exchange proposal, uh, which uh, they guaranteed would keep running despite one hardware or software fault. And uh, the same techniques are probably used in System X and other uh, secure systems now, but disappeared from the ICL uh, repertoire. Thank you. Can I just add that? Uh Every, all those nearly 3,000 machines went out with extra wires in that weren't needed because of Jim and his colleagues. <laughs> They're all less capable of doing what Jim has just proposed. This is part of it and perhaps answer, answer for Dell and saying about small systems. Uh, historically, Stevenage had always been involved in trying to develop a range of mechanisms and right before 1900 science there were projects for direct entry to update data on card files, data on back tapes, data on all sorts of devices. So the sort of concepts of key entry directly onto machines. There was a history of projects in such So it, uh, uh, that, that ties in with the the focus on the small system mar mar marketplace and that grew and was successfully exploited on the 29 and 3 but it's, it's, a, it's a different marketplace from the George, George 3 market, marketplace. Anyway, just another vague story about industrial design. You've been, been sort of referring to Noel London and his rule but the aspect is more about industrial design that the system was given a coherent image. And that's, no one had started early on in ICT and had the year of management and there was a industrial design committee that coordinated these things. The high ups took an interest in the coherent design. 1900 had that, he got an awards for it, it followed through and uh, so he got something that appeared to all to hang together. The colour, the story that no one personally told me, yes, there are lots of arguments, as John says. Um, the tango um, was a sort of accident, he said, because uh, he was wondering what sort of colours would be appropriate, and he knew he'd got to get a presentation, so he looked there in his garage, and there was a tin of orange paint, so he mocked up a sample and said, I'll oh, try, try this. <laughs> there you are. I'll come over to you. Sorry, I was just going to respond back to our friend who was in customer centre amongst other things. It's probably, this is maybe selective recall, but uh, it was probably another marketing interference with the programme down there to this, this question of how was it really a good 1900 system or were we trying to disguise the fact that it wasn't quite a 1900 because there was a risk that it was so much better than a lot of the other small 1900s that were already installed that we could have had a mass 
sort of base rollover, and that was not what Jeff Carson and what the business needed to actually uh, get net new business expansion and ticket expansion overseas, as opposed to uh, all those rental small 1900s coming back in exchange for 2903. So I think it was a bit of a kind of artificially induced set of uh, constraints, largely for sales and marketing purposes. Would you agree? Uh, yes, could I ask you a question? Because <laughs> <laughs> you may know the answer. Many of the 2903s were sold in new, to new business, in particular to people who'd never had a computer system before. And was there a concern, I wonder, about the support load uh, unless the, uh, the, the software systems that were being developed by these customers were kept really simple? And was that the reason why there was so much emphasis on RPG2, which was a very, very simple way of writing programs once you got the hang of it? I mean, we did, all the, we did the training in, in the customer centres. And we were really junior people, fresh out of school or maybe university, doing the demos, and, but also teaching these people, you know, at, at age 21, 22 or something. Oh, and, no, and no experience either in the real world, as it were. Okay, um, two or three answers, but I'll try and be quite brief on that. I mean, the RPG thing was largely to try and position ourselves quite firmly against what IBM were doing at the time. Yeah. Um, and again, as I see Martin there, he's got it quite well documented in his ICL history down there. The whole concept of customer centres and selling small systems out of customer centres rather than the traditional major kind of uh, go to the large client and do the sales work there, I bring the customers into the customer centre, had already been started with the small 1900 programme. Yeah. When it was pioneered up in Manchester, I believe. I remember, um, regional manager called Reg Selby yeah. was the uh, sort of manager in managing that whole exercise. And uh, I think the 2903 again was being channeled largely through the customer centered concept to uh, ensure that we uh, focused on the right kind of business and market opportunity areas. That wasn't to say that we wouldn't sort of do a base role if it turned out to be a good business opportunity for some salesman's bonus at the end of the year. But, uh, <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, <coughs> Actually, that, that's just uh, triggered a, a comment. That, that, um, it was the first, it was probably the first machine where we ever sold them in multiple quantities to individual customers. Um, I, I can't remember the actual numbers, but for, for example, Rankos McDougall, I think, took at least a dozen Book of the Common, took, I believe, 20 or 30. Now, we've never done that with the 1900. Um, the question I was going to ask is, can anybody confirm the rumour that the actual production of the Hot Tango panels on the uh, 2903 actually involved the three-stage painting process that concluded with it being baked on? <laughs> Because a lot of customers wanted to replicate the colour on their office furniture and they just couldn't find any way of doing it. <laughs> well, you know a man who knows the answer, but he's not here. Yeah. Well, that's correct. It was a spat of particular finish that was... That's it. It was a particular finish that was scuff resistant. They went to a lot of trouble to test out, but it, it had emerged over the years from the different ranges of machines. So. It was an advanced, advanced paint process. Certain customers were quite disgruntled that they couldn't easily match it with a tin of paint. Yeah. 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 <laughs> As a complete aside, the chap who ran the paint shop at those days is still alive and with us, and a member of the Double Majority Association. He's not here, so we can't ask him now, but uh, we'll find out. Just, just a yeah. thought, was the um, reason for it being scuff resistant so when people kick the machines? still <laughs> 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 yeah. The blues are also pretty scuff resistant as well. Though. <laughs> I, I got a very simple question. Um, why did ICL change to this 
horrid colour of hot tango and whatever it was. And we had lovely blue and grey machines for years before. And blue happens to be my favourite colour, so maybe I'm biased. <laughs> um, I think well, I sort of the same answer, answer to IBM. I'd like to know really definitively what the answer to that is. I blame Mal London. <laughs> 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 1970s, really, isn't it? Could you, could you say a bit more about the microcoding? Was it actually a fully flexible microcode so that it could have been re-microcoded to, uh, um, sort of dynamically re-microcoded to emulate a completely different machine? Oh yes, um, and we, that was the proposal we made to next off, um, that we would get a hold of their, what they call their, their uh, microcode. Sorry, their autocode and microcode, Microsoft One, to implement it all exactly the same. So, so an individual 1900 instruction would be emulated by a large number of Micos instructions. Yes, I can't remember the actual number to complete it. It was, um, you know, two thousand, I think, of microcode instructions to implement to, to implement the full 1900 autocode. Oh, is that for the whole order code, not for one instruction? Well, it's the you know the code the coding sheet you get, you know, with the one five sevens and all that lot on it. Yeah. Um, but it, there was a, there's a complete spec. It's about that thick of the complete Micos one order code and how to use it. In fact, uh, one or two limitations as well. You were not because of to keep the whole thing going really fast. There were certain constraints, you must not put two microcode instructions together because there, were, there was a small amount of um, uh, pipelining that wasn't going to be used at the time going on within the machine. And we did, we did have a fault we out in the field that caused a hell of a lot of problems for ages where there was one mistake made. It only showed up very rarely in the DDE uh, software. We got a lot of those got called out on that. But it was easy, once we found it, it was dead easy to change. Just put a dumb, dummy instructions between them or something, but uh, I don't know if I'm asking John or Delwyn, but I see the name Micos One referred to a lot on the 2966 peripherals. No, I mean Micos uh, Two. Micos Two, yeah. And they've got Micos Two processors in there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Sorry, 2960 has. 2966. No, that's a further development. Well, it's it's also Micos Two. Um, it's obviously. A, it's obviously a, a more efficient implementation of the architecture that it's my cost to refer to anyway. John, has one survived? Yeah. Um, said so in the Science Museum. We might as well say that's a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> and how many were actually uh, shipped? Well, it's around about 3,000. I was trying to get a definitive answer. Um, yeah, it was, it was well over 2,500. Well, it actually made 3,000. But I include 2,904, you see, in my thinking. It's the same machine, well, they've got a different number. It seems sad to me that uh, the records of our wonderful old company seem to miss out on this sort of information. Um, you know, I was involved from quite a way back. And uh, I, I think it would be really good to know exactly how many machines the company produced and where they went. Is there no record at all? Oh, I think Did, there is. Is there a central record of where the stuff went? The actual records sort of kind of disappeared. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned in passing from the 2905. Um, 2905 was clearly there introduced uh, as top cover for the 290X range. Um, I was working in company at the time. I found out what the 2905 was, and it was a 2950 running DME2, which was uh, the uh, 2903 <laughs> emulation <laughs> equipment. Um, I asked the question, what was the point in launching a machine which already existed under a different name? <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> a, the, oh, answer I, the answer I got was rather interesting. Uh, that our customers were frightened of a grown up 2900, a 2905 something. But if you put 2903 in, they would buy it, and they did, in much larger numbers than they bought the 29, 2950 with DOE2. 
and a certain amount of logic I would not understand. But for example, 1903A went to 1903T and then went back to 1902. Just, just remember, marketing bullshit baffles brain. <laughs>